Well, Gordon, you like Havana, I take it. Uh, I like Havana, and they take it. <laughs> you, uh, you must mean the gambling casinos. Si, si, muchacherino. Anybody's. Well, here we are in Havana, the home of the pineapple and Meyer Lansky, and it's wonderful to be here. For the American mafia, the 1950s were a time of prosperity in spite of gathering storm clouds. Televised congressional hearings brought heat that diminished a few illegal gambling outlets, but the organization was largely untouched and remained a mystery to the American public. They had expanded into legal gambling in Las Vegas, but as long as they were on American soil, there would be complications. For six years, however, the mob had a far friendlier venue for their services. Cuba, under the dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista, allowed mobsters to operate legal casinos with no strings, aside from some under-the-table payoffs. Gambling in Cuba would be a substantial source of income for the mob until the 1959 Cuban Revolution took hold and Fidel Castro shut the casinos down as part of a larger program of shaking off American economic influence. For many, this history is best known as dramatized in The Godfather Part II. Crime author T.J. English wanted to change that, and so he wrote a book, first released in 2007 as The Havana Mob. Gangsters, gamblers, showgirls, and revolutionaries in 1950s Cuba. It's currently published as Havana Nocturne, How the Mob Owned Cuba and Then Lost It to the Revolution. Not only was the new title catchier, but it better reflects the story English wanted to tell. Havana Nocturne isn't just a mafia book but a proper history book looking to give readers a full understanding of the time and the city. In that regard, it reminds me of Lawrence Bergerin's Al Capone biography, albeit without improbably claiming Capone answered to an obscure Chicago Heights mobster and racking up a disproportionate amount of his later behavior to syphilis. T.J. English's history isn't that bad. Havana Nocturne starts with the arrival of Charles Lucky Luciano, the founder of the modern American Mafia, in the Cuban capital for a 1946 mob conference. And the first of his old colleagues to meet him is Meyer Lansky, the loose basis of Godfather antagonist Hyman Roth. Among other issues discussed at the Havana conference, Lansky himself made the case to start an offshore gambling operation in the Caribbean, starting in Cuba. Cuba, English tells us, has been of interest to Lansky as early as 1928, with his suggesting to Luciano that they could expand their rum-running operations on the island into gambling and legitimate businesses, with a national government they could co-opt rather than the one they were perpetually at odds with. To put this in historical context, the American Mafia as we know it is considered to have been established in 1931. At this point, it should be noted that T.J. English is one of those authors who is willing to use the dubious Last Testament of Lucky Luciano as a source. This book, based on notes supposedly from meetings with Luciano and filmmaker Martin Gosch, was falsely marketed as being based on tapes of said meetings. And upon release, enough errors were found to raise serious questions on the book's authenticity. English's position is that enough of the book checked out that he was justified in what he called a middle ground of using it when collaborated by another source. This role is usually filled by the 1979 Lansky biography Mogul of the Mob, and in particular, its interviews with one of Lansky's childhood friends turned cronies, Joseph Doc Stalker. Stalker helps English build his narrative of a grand conspiracy of the Mafia taking over a country 
By claiming to have accompanied Lansky on a 1933 trip to Cuba, Luciano described, where they supposedly delivered a bribe on behalf of the so-called National Crime Syndicate to the man emerging as the head of the island's new military junta, Fulgencio Batista, and, of course, excluding the Last Testament as a source, would also prevent English from using some of the book's colorful quotes. Meyer Lansky would end up taking charge of the Cuba project in the coming years, and unlike his fictional counterpart Hyman Roth, he never had to betray anyone to get his way. The reason the mob was meeting in Havana was that Lucky Luciano had been deported from the United States to Italy after World War II in what was itself a commutation of a 30 to 50 year prison sentence after the US found out he was, in allegedly his own words, practically back in America, they pressured the Cuban government to send him back to Italy. Luciano's influence is diminished, and Meyer Lansky becomes the most prominent mob character in the book. With one noted exception, investors from the New York Mafia are hereafter reduced to bit players. Indeed, the reason Lansky became such a major player in Cuba was that he was an honest crook. He'd first been referred to Batista in 1937 to help restore the reputation of the mismanaged Oriental racetrack in Havana. Then, in 1952, he was hired by the Cuban government as Advisor on Gambling Reform to help clean up the epidemic of razzle-dazzle, unregulated rigged games that had generated a scandal for preying on American tourists. After Lansky, the second major character is El Presidente Batista. He officially held the title from 1940 to 1944 before a brief retirement, then preempted the 1952 elections with a military coup because, despite being a well-known candidate, he was only polling third. English gives us a fairly even assessment of him. Throughout his career, he's described as a benign dictator in comparison to his Caribbean contemporaries. Batista is a reformer in the first half of his reign, with his accomplishments, including introducing the Cuban constitution, he would abrogate to launch the second half. On a personal level, English paints Batista in a borderline aspirational light. Rising from a poor family in a racially segregated company town to the leader of the country. That said, English points out early on Batista neglected the bulk of the island as he encouraged Havana's development, and he doesn't let El Presidente off the hook for bombing civilians while trying to save his regime from Castro. Besides his own secret police, Batista also has the backing of one Senator Rolando Masferrar and his terrorist paramilitary Los Tigres. Los Tigres are a relic of the anarchic period of gangsterismo, where political factions all took up arms after Batista's constitution curbed the army's political power. Gangsterismo was something Castro had renounced early on and something Batista should have swept aside as Cuban strongman. Castro is the third main character. The irony that Batista, born at the bottom of Cuba's social structure, would become a defender of the rich and powerful, while Fidel Castro, from a wealthy family, leads a revolution for the common people, is not lost on English. Castro's story, too, can be a source of inspiration, as he just keeps bouncing back in spite of failures, military disasters, and near-death experiences. The limited historical scope of the book, however, means readers won't gain much insight as to how Castro remained, as English puts it. The people's choice, despite not delivering on his promise to restore democracy, with our fourth and final main character, 
we go from gangsterismo back to plain old gangsters. Santo Trapicante Jr. was the boss of Tampa's resident mafia family, from the retirement of his father, Santo Sr., to his own death in 1987. Trapicante is the only official mafia boss to relocate to Cuba. Besides his father's criminal interests, Trafficante also inherited Santo Sr.'s distrust of Meyer Lansky, who, because he was Jewish, could never be an official member of the Mafia, and whose success in Cuba, traditionally in the Trafficante's sphere of influence, made him as much a rival as a business partner. We're told Trafficante made a tenuous alliance with New York boss Albert Anastasia, when the latter felt he wasn't given enough of a cut of Havana's action, and English goes on to claim, without much actual evidence, that because of this friction, Lansky was the one who organized Anastasia's 1957 assassination. English has first-hand accounts from companions of our two main mobsters. For Traficante, he has the memoirs of his lawyer, Frank Rigano, co-authored by New York Times journalist Selwyn Robb of Five Families fame, Mob Lawyer is probably best known for including a purported confession from his old client of responsibility for the JFK assassination, but it also includes some time the two spent being entertained in Cuba along with their business dealings. For Lansky, English has a source who only emerged in the 21st century. Armando Jaime Casiedes was a Cuban-born croupier who'd been working in Las Vegas when, in 1957, he returned to his homeland after being hired by Lansky to work as his driver and bodyguard. Jaime remained in Cuba after the revolution, living in obscurity until he was interviewed by Cuban author Enrique Cerules for his 2004 book La Vida Secreta de Mayalansky in La Habana. And during his research, English would have the opportunity to correspond with Jaime, though the bodyguard died shortly before they could have a face-to-face -face meeting. Jaime's stories tend to veer into sensational territory, including his recollections of a tense visit to the Dominican Republic when Lansky was looking into a Plan B for an offshore gambling empire, and a hitherto secret dash to warn the casino owners after Lansky was told of Batista's resignation. But Cerules and English both found him credible. When I do book reviews, I feel obligated to include at least some fact-checking, and that tends to implant a lot of negativity into these videos. So let me make it clear. I actually liked this book. I own Havana Nocturne in audiobook form, so my first experiences with it were listening while half paying attention on walks. It didn't sink in until I actually sat down to read the book, how succinct it was. Minus its references and acknowledgments, Havana Nocturne is 330 pages long. That's about average for a mafia book, but for a book that gives the full context of the city and the revolution, it's remarkably brief. And yet, I still felt TJ English had managed to squeeze in all the information a reader needs to get the full picture. This is also where the title change better reflects the book's content. While English doesn't have much time to discuss the homegrown Havana mob that worked with the Americans, a sizable portion of the book details the vibrant nightlife that accompanied the gambling boom and made Cuba a premier exotic vacation destination for Americans. As an American who grew up homeschooled in isolated villages in North Yorkshire, I must say I found this description of what was, if not always enticing, certainly intriguing. The music scene in Havana is described as both beneficiary and complement to the casinos. 
drawing in American talent that innovated on the established jazz music with Cuban influence and styles. English also notes how a large number of African American entertainers, detailing Eartha Kitt and Nat King Cole in particular, thrived in Cuba while 50s America remained largely segregated. My story is much too sad to be told. Though not a part of the Havana scene proper, Frank Sinatra is also worth mentioning in how his involvement bookends English's story. In the beginning, he socializes with Lucky Luciano in Havana, helping draw the attention that leads to Lucky being permanently deported from the Western Hemisphere. In the end, he makes an ill-timed investment in the unrealized Monte Carlo de la Habana casino project. Finally, there was the draw of sex as entertainment on the island, which English describes in depth. Prostitution is rampant without the involvement of American Mafia interlopers, running a spectrum from impoverished women to high-class brothels. The casino and nightclub showrooms are host to elaborate burlesque shows, and outside these are the live sex shows that were used as the backdrop for a key scene in Godfather 2. English touches on the real-life long-length performer known as Superman, as well as the creative skits these performances were often delivered through. For someone strictly looking for a Mafia book, this sort of diversion won't be of much interest. For me, it's a welcome change from the same old stories of rubouts and RICO prosecutions in New York. And if you too are intrigued, I have good news. English's next book, Dangerous Rhythms, Jazz and the Underworld, looks like it will be a broader history in much the same vein as Havana Nocturne. I know I'll be looking for a copy when it comes out this August.